Welcome to Podcasting 101 201. We have a ton of stuff to cover. Uh, there's also going to be a 301 after lunch. So if we don't get to all of your questions at the end, if you want to stop by for 301, we're going to continue the conversation. Uh, first thing I want to ask is, how many of you have podcasts already? Well, I, you're not allowed to raise your hand for this stuff. <laughs> okay. And uh, how many of you are thinking about having a podcast? Uh, that's why you're here, right? <laughs> right? Okay. So how many of you have your concept? Or are we still in basic idea phase? Okay. Okay, great. So if you have a comment or a question at any time, please just go ahead and ask. We'll roll right through it. So for those of you who don't know me, hi, <laughs> I'm Crystal, and they put a table like right here so I can't walk, and that's going to annoy me. There we go. I'm Crystal O'Connor, and I currently work for Lipson, which is a podcasting host and distribution company based here out of Pittsburgh. Before that, I worked in web hosting. I actually worked at Pair Networks, which is a web hosting company based out of Pittsburgh. I've been in tech for a little over 15 years. So I've been doing this for a little while. Uh, podcasting is, is a special sort of love. Uh, it, is, it takes time to produce, but it's, it's out of all the things that I have, have done in my 15 years of tech, it's, it, it's a project of love. And that's one of the things I love about it. And I love meeting people. And podcasting allows you to meet people. So we're going to start by talking about creating your show concept. Because before you hit the record button, you need to have some semblance of an idea of what you're going to talk about. Right. Be nice to know what we're going to talk about. So we start very broad. We start talking about our overarching topic. Are you going to talk about tech? Are you going to talk about religion? Are you going to talk about news of the day? As we start to look at our topic, we're going to start to narrow that topic down. Maybe if you're talking about news, are you going to talk about American news? Are you talking about world news? Uh, in the world of podcasting, there's a couple different shows. I actually think I have a slide on it. Yep, next one. Where we start looking at our audience and you can really start to, as you have your topic, you really start to narrow your niche down partially based on your audience. The example I like to give is Lipson's podcast, The Feed. They're podcasts about podcasting. If you like podcasting, if you host with Lipson, if you don't host with Lipson, if you want to have a podcast, if you have a podcast, if you're a procaster, an indie podcaster, it doesn't matter. The Feed is the show for you. If you are a lady, who wants to podcast, however, the show She Podcasts might be a better option for you. Why? Because that show is all about podcasting for women. So they've niched their topic down. So we started with a broad topic, podcasting, and we're niching it down a little bit based on our audience. The news example, uh, if you want to niche your topic down to American news or maybe Pittsburgh news, those are all ways to look at your demographic, look at your audience, take an overreaching topic, and start bringing it down to something more specific to what you want to talk about and what your audience may be listening to. So we talk about narrowing our concept into specifics. And the three specifics that I always talk about are show title, show description, and show artwork. We're going to get a little more in depth on these as we go along, but your show title is searchable in iTunes. So there can be keywords associated with your title. We're going to look at some examples in a minute, but you don't want to spam those keywords. We're going to talk about that a little bit as well. So three or four keywords that make sense about what your show is. Maybe it's a little bit creative. But it should be something that if somebody searches on your topic, they're going to find you. It should make sense. Uh, your show description is your elevator pitch. So we've taken our topic, we've narrowed down our niche, 
we're creating our show title, and now we need to pitch our show to the potential listener or potential viewer. So two to three sentences, elevator pitch, what is my show about? Because when somebody is in iTunes or Stitcher or what have you, they're going to see show title, show artwork, and description right off the bat. So that's your chance to sell why that listener should listen to your show. And your show artwork. Everybody get out your smartphones and take a picture of this right here. It's incredibly important. It's not just about how it looks. There are technical specifications that go into that artwork. If you do not meet those requirements, you cannot submit your show to iTunes. Period, the end, finale. Can't do it. So, to reiterate what's up there for those listening who may not be able to see slides, your show artwork must be a minimum of 1,400 by 1,400 pixels or a maximum of 3,000 by 3,000 pixels in size. Anything in between goes as long as it's square. So your artwork could be 2,000 by 2,000 pixels. That's fine. It cannot be 2,000 by 2,001 pixels. iTunes will yell at you when you try to submit, and so will everyone else. It must be square. It needs to be under 500 kilobytes in file size. Now, this is actually not even listed in the iTunes te technical specification. However, we have spoken with iTunes many, many times on this topic, and if your artwork is larger than 500 kilobytes in file size, it can cause problems with your show updating in the iTunes store. So make sure it's under 500 kilobytes in file size. It should use sRGB color space. Most, technical, uh, most digital artwork is going to be sRGB color space. But if you're working with a designer who maybe is more accustomed to print, just make sure that they know to use sRGB color space. It should be a JPG, JPEG, or a PNG file. Word of caution on PNG files, do not use transparency. It will make your artwork look very fuzzy. iTunes and other directories will accept it. It's unnecessary and it's just not gonna look very nice. And you're gonna email me and say, why does my artwork look really fuzzy in iTunes? because it's transparent. So, no transparency. So let's go back to titles for a second. I mentioned that we would take a look at some really good title examples. Daniel J. Lewis is the audacity to podcast. Great guy, if you're not listening to him and you're interested in podcasting, listen to him. Um, I like this title because it's creative. The audacity to podcast is kind of funny. He also runs a clean comedy show, so He's a little funny. But it has the word podcast in it. So if you're in iTunes and you're looking for shows about podcasting and you do a search for podcast, you're probably going to find Daniel J. Lewis's The Audacity to Podcast. It's also a very clearly defined topic. When you first look at that title, what do you think this show is about? Something to do with podcasting, right? It's very clear. So it's a great title. She podcasts. Sorry, Elsie, I'm picking on you like you wouldn't believe. One of the co-hosts of the show is sitting right there. I like this title because there's keywords, podcasts. You know this is about podcasting. It's very clear. Um, but the audience is also very clearly defined. She podcasts. So it's something podcasting and something lady, very obviously. So I like that title. Fantasy Footballers Podcast. I honestly never listened to that show. I probably should. I'd like to. We're coming into the football season, so now would be a good time to start. I actually found them looking through the top 200 in the iTunes store doing research for this presentation. And I really like their title because there's keywords. Fantasy football. Fantasy footballers. If you're into football and fantasy, fantasy football, you're going to find this show. It's going to pop up. Podcast. They could probably drop the word podcast because that might throw off their search. Somebody searching for stuff about podcasts. Um, but a lot of people like to tack on podcasts or show or radio, something like that. If someone's looking for fantasy football specifically as a phrase, would that still be picked up even though it's... It can. The so there's... The word will still be searchable as a keyword? Right. So there's other searchable fields in iTunes. The two searchable fields we're going to talk a little bit more about are the show title and episode titles. So you can pick it up in episode titles as well, and your author. 
your author tag, which we're going to get to. Those are all searchable fields. The other thing is in iTunes, you're looking not just at the keywords in your titles and your authors, but you're also looking at how many subscribers your show has had all time. That's the iTunes search algorithm. It's title, author, how many times your show has been subscribed to all time. So one of the beefs with iTunes is that you can go into iTunes and look at uh, a certain search term and you find a show that's regularly updating content and they've been around for about six months and it's a fantastic show and they've got great ratings and great reviews, great keywords, but there's another show that's been around for eight years that hasn't produced anything in three, but because they've been around for a long time, they have more all-time subscribers, so that can throw off the search algorithm a little bit. They're working on that. It's getting better. I'm sorry, I just want to clarify. Yeah. So if I would search for football, it would still pick this up from footballers? Hopefully, yeah. yeah. I would recommend using a combination between your titles, your author, your episode descriptions to make sure it's all so picking it up. Right, yeah. Now we talked a little bit about artwork. I pulled out some uh, good artwork examples. I actually reached out to some of my podcasting friends to see what they thought was great artwork. Out of these, uh, do any of you have a certain favorite? Dan Carlin. Okay, why? It's purely based off the fact how much I love that show. <laughs> Anybody else? Alice isn't dead? Yeah, I have no idea what that is. Yeah. Does anybody notice anything interesting about that particular show artwork? I actually listened to this show for a little while, and it actually took one of our coworkers to point it out to me when I put it up on this presentation. There's a hidden image in there. The skull. The skull, right. It's, it's a truck when it brings down it's a skull it's a that's a storytelling podcast um, which happens to be titled Alice isn't dead and it reads a lot like an audiobook it's it's a great show uh, Dan Carlin he, he's been at this for a really long time I've been working at Lipson for six years and I don't think that artwork has changed it hasn't needed to it's just a great show and great artwork Laura is another storytelling show and it's very simple it's just the word Lore. This is who I am. Lore. Starting from nothing is a... I like this artwork because it, it's a show about starting your business from nothing. And it's just a plain black square that has nothing in it but the words starting from nothing. So it's actually a little symbolic. And the same thing with 99% Invisible. Um, they just have the one little block here. The Audacity to Podcast, I actually put Daniels up here for a reason. And that's because he has a microphone in his artwork. Typically, it's not recommended putting microphones in your artwork because it's a little too cliche and everybody has kind of done that to nauseam. But his show is about podcasting and about tech behind podcasting. So for him, it makes sense to go ahead and put a microphone in your artwork. Even though in his blog post where he taught, he's also a graphic designer, in his own blog post where he talks about creating show artwork, he specifically says, don't put microphones in your artwork. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got a microphone in his, in his artwork because it makes sense for him. Is there a minimum font size that you want to have in order to be readable on a small graphic pencil that might be present on iTunes or wherever? Mm -hmm. So... The trick with artwork is kind of like a business card. Have you ever heard anybody tell you to have a really great business card? Take it and drop it on the floor and look at it from up here and see if you can tell what that card is like. Same thing with artwork. Because as he mentioned, that artwork is going to be shown in different sizes and different resolutions across a number of different devices and depending on what directory it's being viewed in. Even in iTunes, you have a page for your show it's going to have a nice big version of your artwork in the upper left-hand corner. 
But when you run a search and you're looking at the episode list that return back from that search, your artwork is going to be like this on the monitor. It's going to be extremely small. So if you have a lot of text in there, it's going to be really hard to read. Nobody's going to be able to understand what that really is. So you definitely want to make sure you're using big fonts. Let's elaborate on why I actually really do like that. Because it feels like it's staring right at me. And that's exactly how the show is. It's so in-depth, so emotional, and it conveys exactly what the show resonates with. You see that looking through, it looks right at you, but that's just the show. 22 hours on World War One. that's what you like. There you go. There you go. So you connected with it when, when you saw it. And that's, excuse me, that's going to be very true when you're looking through a directory. The first thing you're going to see is going to be the artwork. The title might be right next to it, but hopefully, if you've done your job, the eye is going to go straight to that artwork. So that artwork really is important, and it's something that's going to connect with your potential listener. Uh, do you have suggestions for sources of artwork? I mean, just find somebody who knows mm -hmm. a graphic artist who loves to do stuff and want to do stuff for you? Or? Of course you can hire a graphic designer. Uh, they can be expensive unless you have one who's a friend. Sure. Um, other options would be Canva, C-A-N-V-A. It's a really great option, web-based or app-based, for creating artwork. And they now actually have a template specific for podcast artwork. So Canva, C-A-N-V-A. VA is a great option. The only caveat I will put there is that they don't always make sure the artwork they export for you once you've done your design is under 500 kilobytes in file size. So you may need to optimize that a little bit. Um, just walk, just keep an eye on that. That's my only caveat there. But that's for actually designing your own. That's for designing your own. Um, another option some have gone with is Fiverr. F-I-V-E-R. They are an option for low-cost freelance. Two R's. Two R's. F-I-V-E-R-R. There we go. Um, the only caveat I will put on that is they are low-cost freelancers. So um, some people have had really great artwork created, and some people have, eh, I'm not really a fan. And, uh, so it really depends on who you go with, but those are some options. <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about gear, and actually during Dave's keynote, somebody had actually brought up the question of gear, and I was sitting in my chair smiling because we have some examples for you today. Uh, but we're going to talk first about the microphone, because you need something to talk into. Now. Yes, you can get away with using your computer's microphone and your iPhone's microphone. Um, and you can start that way if you really want to. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you can go with a low-cost microphone that's going to give you a little bit better audio and then start to upgrade. I put some prices here so that you get some idea. Uh, but these are more pro-level microphones. Um, the Heil PR40 and the Blue Yeti Pro. I have the Blue Yeti up here on the table. Um, these are condenser microphones. And a condenser microphone is really meant for studio work. It's meant for a quiet environment. If you have a refrigerator, especially an old one, on the other wall of your office, like I do, that is going to pick up that refrigerator. It's very sensitive. That means they also can produce, if set up correctly, really phenomenal audio, a condenser microphone. But you do have to watch the other sounds around you. The Blue Yeti Pro, I like to call kind of a prosumer. It's on the higher end of what a consumer might use. It allows you to change the pattern on the microphone. So if you, as you're passing that around, if you look at the dial on it, it allows you to switch between whether or not it wants you to talk here or here or on both sides. And it actually changes what direction the microphone wants you to talk into. So when you're looking at microphones for a condenser, you're looking at the fact that A, it's going to want a quiet environment. Um, B, if it's set up correctly, it's going to give you some really nice audio. 
up. But C, you also want to look at its direction, what directional pattern it's set up for, whether or not you're going to talk into it like this, or like this, or like this. <laughs> uh, all depends on the microphone that you're choosing. With the pattern, you know, to change the pattern on it, does that mean you could more easily have two individuals? Some people do that. Yes. Because you can change the pattern. Or is that my right, pattern? right. So it can pick up on both sides. And both that sides. particular microphone, it'll pick up on both sides. So you can sit it in between you and a person like this. Hi, how are you today? And you can just talk. And you set it on a table, and it should be able to pick up both. Um, I mean, if you didn't have two mics. Right? If you don't have two mics. Now, if you do have two mics or if you're traveling a lot, that is not a microphone I would recommend. I would recommend two microphones, I would recommend two dynamics, which is the next slide. Uh, but if you're in an in-home studio and you and your partner or friend or whatever are all talking into the microphone, you can certainly set it up that way, especially when you're getting started and you don't want to spend a ton of money on a whole bunch of microphones. My collection is one that I've been collecting since high school, thanks to band. So, <laughs> so speaking of dynamic microphone, mm, one other thing. A lot of these microphones that are coming out now, this is more like a studio microphone. So if you look on the bottom of that, of that Blue Yeti, there's two inputs. One is an XLR, uh, which is what would normally plug into something like a mixer or a recorder, uh, both of which I have up here. But some of them are coming out condensers and dynamics, where you can also plug in USB. And the nice thing about plugging in USB is you no longer need this big guy. You can plug it in straight to your computer and use your computer to do the recording. Now, some dynamic mics will do that as well. A dynamic mic is more used for live demonstrations. All three of these are dynamic mics. This is the one Dave was talking about in his keynote. It's the Audio-Technica ATR2100. It is an extremely popular microphone. I'm going to take the fuzzy off of it. It's an, ex the table. <laughs> it's, it's an extremely popular microphone right now amongst podcasters. It does accept XLR, so it can plug into a mixer, and it'll pass it around. But it also accepts USB. It's lightweight. It's not terribly expensive. It was when I bought it running for 50 bucks. Right now on Amazon, it's 79. But keep an eye because the thing goes on sale all the time. And when it does, buy two. <laughs> it has a pretty good audio quality for its price. Uh, it is dynamic, so it's great for live vocal, but it's also directional. So you're going to talk into it kind of like this. You're not going to talk like you're going to talk directly into the head of the microphone. The other nice thing about this is you can plug this with the right cables and adapters into your iPhone and use an app in order to record on the go. So you can take this, a cable, your iPhone, and have your podcasting studio in your pocket. Now, this is the Shure SM5848. They have a 58 also. This is my old band microphone. I think I spent about 30 bucks on it. If you look at it, it's actually dented on the side. It still works like a charm. And because I had it sitting around in my basement when I started working for Lipson and decided I was going to try my own hand at this podcasting thing, this was the microphone I pulled out. So this thing can get beat up until the cows come. This microphone is the Sennheiser MD46, which my loving husband got for me in order to do interviews at conferences. This microphone was actually originally created for the Olympics in order to do interviews. It is an interview mic. That's why it has a long stem on it. It's extremely directional. So when I talk into it here, you barely hear what's going on around you. It's going to pick up what's right in front of your mouth more than most microphones because that's what it's made to do. It's extremely directional. 
So again, when you're looking at these microphones, some of these are made for a specific application. So one of the things I always like to talk about when you're picking a microphone is you're looking at what's the environment you're using it in at home, if you're recording at home. You're looking at price, because price matters for all of us. We all have a budget. Um, you're looking at what you're hooking it up to. Are you hooking it up to a portable recorder? Like one of these guys? Are you going to hook it in your iPhone? Are you going to hook it in your computer? Are you going to hook it into a mixer? So what are you going to plug it into? And what is the application? Because you can have a fantastic microphone, but in the wrong application, it's not going to work out for you and you're going to hate it. Now there are some accessories that can help improve the quality of your audio with a microphone. Uh, the first one that I list here is a boom arm or a desk stand. A boom arm or a desk, st a desk stand is going to get the microphone up off of your desk or your table, which helps reduce handling noise and vibrations that go into the microphone, which can actually get picked up by your recording. So especially if you're someone who's going to be typing during your show, for whatever reason, updating your notes, or maybe you're scrolling and you've got that Mac mouse that goes click, click, click. That was my problem. <laughs> does, um, a boom arm is going to help bring that microphone up and reduce those vibration noises. Next up is a pop filter. The pop filter is going to sit in front of your microphone and you're actually going to talk into the pop filter. And the reason for the pop filter is to reduce plosives. Your buzz and your buzz. The, um, it also reduces moisture from hitting the microphone, and over time, that moisture can degrade the microphone if there's a lot of it, um, but that is over time. So pop filters can be really helpful for that. And I believe next on the list, yep, shock mounts. Now, the MD46 has a shock mount already on it. I just left it on just to show. This is the shock mount for the Blue Yeti Pro. And if you look at the shock mount, you'll notice that it has a mount, actually it sits like this. So the microphone sits in here like this, but it also has these rubber band guys going around the shock mount. And again, the whole point to the shock mount is to reduce vibrations and handling noise that goes into the microphone. So the point to all of this, you can get dust stands for 10 bucks on Amazon. You can get a pop filter for two bucks on Amazon. You can get a shock mount, depending on your microphone, for anywhere from $20 and up. So we're not talking about breaking your bank, but we are talking about getting the best audio we can at the beginning so that when we go to edit later, we A, don't have to spend as much time editing, and B, the folks sitting in their cars listening to their speakers as they're rolling down the highway with their windows down aren't going, oh man, that audio. <laughs> we want to record high because the best quality we can get is going to save us time and it's going to make our listeners like their ears more. The other thing you're going to need is a set of he headphones or earbuds. doesn't have to be anything fancy. Uh, I actually know quite a few people who edit with the iPhone earbuds because that's what their listeners are listening through but you need to be able to hear what you're recording. It's called monitoring. So when you're recording, you need to be listening to yourself. You need to be listening to your guest so that you can hear those levels. You can hear if there's an echo. You can hear if there's anything funky so you can stop and you can fix it because otherwise you're gonna go through an hour long interview with that celebrity guest and at the very end you're gonna go, oh crap, there was an echo and a hiss through that whole thing and it sounds terrible always monitor and you need something to record with now you can record onto a computer any computer PC Chromebook Mac will work you can record on a mobile device I've done it on Android and on iPhone works fine that ATR 2100 wherever it's floating is a great option for that or a portable recorder and actually I have a box back there, I'll grab it, uh, where I list out some recommendations for microphones, recorders, boom arms, anything along those lines.
So if you haven't gotten your equipment yet, or um, you want to know some of the other options available out there, there's some items in there. Of course, it's not an exhaustive list. It's just some of the items I have worked with. You mentioned Chromebooks? Mm -hmm. Is that USB. If you have something that can record and pick up a USB mic, you're good. And do you need recording directly to uh, what little hard drive space there is, or, or is recording directly to your online? I would assume space? it would depend on whatever app you're using. Okay. There are available web apps like Mixlar yeah. uh, or Alphonic yeah. that are web based apps that can allow you to record to the cloud. And they, they do well. I mean, that's the catch. Yeah. That's always the catch. But yeah, I mean, as long as the Chromebook can pick up that, that microphone and you've got something to record to, that's all you need. Wow. And so there's online applications that work as well. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, you can go with a preamp and a mixer if you really want to. You don't have to start out with them. I do have an example mixer up here. For the record, this thing cost me about 100 bucks, about 15 years ago and it's still rocking this is what runs all of my podcasts I would love to upgrade someday <laughs> but <clears throat> what you would use a mixer for particularly is if you have multiple inputs so let's say you have a Skype call on your computer and you have you that you want to hear so you will plug both of those into a mixer or some device that will allow mixing so that you can control the levels the volume of each channel and you can actually hear both sides of the conversation. Uh, some other ways you could use something like a mixer is if you're going to play little sound effects or whatever throughout your show, you might play the sound effect on your computer or on your iPad using a cart app. Plug that in here, plug your microphone in here. This would then go out to a recorder or your computer. Some of them are USB enabled. This one is not, so mine actually goes into my handheld recorder. And preamps, preamps are good if you have multiple people in the same room recording. I mentioned earlier, you all need to monitor yourselves. Well, if you have, if you have a co-host, multiple co-hosts or guests in the same room, they should be monitoring themselves too. And the best way to split that audio so that everybody can hear themselves properly is through a preamp. So if you go online and you say, what hardware, what gear do I need in order to podcast, you can spend anywhere from $50 to a couple grand, depending on the blog post you land on and the recommendations. You really don't need to. So I often put these under nice, not required, not, not required to get started. This may be a technical question for later, so. Okay. <laughs> So I have a preamp, but um, for up to two mics, mm -hmm. focus right in Scarlet. Yeah. Um, if I was getting someone who is calling on Skype or Google, um, how, how would I? You don't need the preamp. Um, so I can preamp for myself, because I have my, my microphone to, the, to my computer, but as far as I just record down to the same computer. Um, right. And, yep. That works just fine. For them through the as well. Yeah, you don't run them through the preamp. Yeah. Mm -mm. Nope, straight out of the mixer. What I would recommend for a Skype call is what we call a mix minus, and that goes a little outside the scope of what I have time to cover here. But uh, if you want to write it down, Ray Ortega, R A Y O R T E G A. Correct my spelling if I'm off. <laughs> Ray Ortega. He runs a show called The Podcaster Studio and also The Podcaster's Roundtable. He has a fantastic video on YouTube for running a mix minus. And when I was first learning this stuff, it was that video that taught me how to do it. And what that's going to allow you to do is take a caller from Google Hangouts on Air, Skype, whatever on your computer, run it through a mixer, run your mic through a mixer. Everybody can hear themselves. There's no echo, and you can record it. So that that is what you want is the mix minus, and his is by far the best tutorial. So that's so a YouTube. YouTube tutorial, Ray Ortega. Great tutorial on the mix minus. Thank you. No problem. 
So whether you're recording on your computer or doing some editing, you're probably going to want some software. Uh, you're welcome to take a picture of this if you want. Uh, these are some of the most popular that I see out there of all different, all different types. GarageBand is Mac only. Audacity will work on Mac and PC and it's free. It's a great, app, uh, great application for getting started. Audition is Mac and PC, though pricey. It comes with the Adobe Creative Cloud subscription, which is 50 bucks a month. Alphonic, I mentioned, that's a cloud-based system, so you can use apps, you can use a desktop app, you can go in browser, you can record, you can do editing, you can do publishing. It's kind of awesome. Boss Jock is iOS only. You can do recording, you can add sound effects, bring in other audio, publish out, no editing though. Twisted Wave, they do have a desktop version. Mm. I really like them on iOS though, where if I have something already recorded, they will do recording, but usually if I have something already recorded, I use them to edit. I use them to edit on my iPad. I actually do a lot of editing on my iPad. Four. I personally use Audition for editing uh, if I'm on computer. If I'm on my iPad, I do use Twisted Wave. There's another one out there that's kind of new on the market that's really nice. It's beautiful. It's called Ferret. But the problem with Ferret is it only exports an M4A. And we're going to talk about encoding. Uh, you want an MP3 for podcasting. And I talked to the developer, and he's not quite ready to add MP3 export capability, which is why I didn't put it on the list. It's a beautiful app, though. Twisted Wave is very functional, not very pretty. Very easy to find your way around, though. So talking about episode workflow, so we have our topic, we've got our gear. So how do we go about creating an episode? Well, hopefully, you're going to prepare by creating an outline of some sort doesn't have to be fancy, it doesn't have to be a ton, it can be high level bullet points, whatever it might be, whatever works for you, but you need to outline or somewhat prepare what you're going to talk about in that episode. You're going to hit record, you're going to record your episode, you're going to edit to some extent, some people edit more than others, but you're going to edit to some extent, and then you're going to create that final mp3 file. Now you have an episode. For creating your episode outline, personally, I'm a really big fan of OneNote. That's just me. Um, a lot of people use Evernote. Some people use Word. Some people use Notepad. What do you use, Elsie? Uh, you use you use Google Docs. Yes. For my personal notes, it's my word for collaborative stuff. But actually, Justin, I use Trello. Trello. That's another option. Um, I do high-level bullet points, just so that when I'm talking, I don't forget something that I really wanted to mention. Some people will actually script. Uh, Rob Walsh from Today in iOS, who also works for Lipson, he scripts. But one of the things that he talks about when he talks about scripting yourself is don't write your script like you would write a paper. Write a script like you talk. Because otherwise, it's going to sound like you're reading a novel instead of talking. So if you're going to script, script in the ums, script in the ahs. Those things are conversational. Script in the pauses. Script in those things that don't make it sound like you're reading if you are going to script. That's Rob Walsh's advice. I cannot take credit for that one. So for episode development, I just wrote down some of the things that I know either myself or a lot of people use for getting their episodes underway. Research tools like uh, Google. I use Feedly and Pocket a lot. If I see something in Feedly I like, I'll save it in Pocket. I do a lot of news stuff, so I like to save my sources. Uh, Co-host or guest collaboration, OneNote, Evernote, Google Docs, Slack, all. Um, all tools for episode development. Note taking, OneNote, Evernote, Notepad, pen and paper, whatever works for you. Writing show notes, she already mentioned it, Byword or Ulysses, uh, both of which will work on Mac, 
Uh, they'll work on iOS. Basically, what I'm getting at with this one, if I can sidetrack for a moment, if you're going to write show notes that you're eventually going to put on your website or in your feed for your podcast, use either a plain text editor or do it in what's called Markdown, which will export in HTML. Please do yourself a favor, because I see this all the time. <laughs> do not write the notes that you're going to put on a website in something like Microsoft Word. Happens all the time. You copy the text, you paste it into your editor, your WYSIWYG, in WordPress or whatever you're using to create your website, and it's going to copy over all this extra code that exists in Word or similar that you can't see. But the software being used to read that can, and it will break. If you copy and then paste as plain text? Plain text is fine. So I mean, obviously, then the yep. formatting is going to be off if you have like bullet points. And that's where something like Markdown can come in really handy, okay. because you can use Markdown in order to create bullet points and links and so forth. It's used as a short form for creating HTML without having to know HTML. So for example, a plus sign becomes a bullet point. Uh, a, a bracket becomes a URL. So there's this okay. short, short text, short little things that you, that you learn very quickly. It's very quick and onboarding. Will interpret those. What, well, what you do is you export it as HTML. When you, in your Markdown editor, you can export as HTML. Some of them, like ByWord, like now Ulysses, that's new, you can actually publish to something like WordPress straight from the app. So I'll write my notes in ByWord on my iPad at lunch, and then I publish straight to WordPress. It's got all my formatting, all my images, everything's ready to rock because it'll convert that Markdown to HTML automatically. So you can use plain text or Markdown. Those are the two safest bets. Forgive me, I've heard of Markdown. That's a format. It's not an application. Right? Correct. Okay. Correct. You would use a Markdown editor okay. in order to work in Markdown. And, and Markdown editor is which application? Do you have? Byword, Ulysses. Um, not sure if Word has added it yet. I don't think they have. Word is not. So. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think so. Those are all word processing editors. The idea is to stay away from word processors and, and go with something more meant for online application. Now you said you prefer OneNote yourself. Or your I like OneNote. So then you, then if for, for material that you would then want to publish, did you just paste it then into ByWord and Ulysses? And then go That's there? exactly what I do. I write my notes. So I do my research in Feedly. I save anything that I want to keep in an archive and pocket. When I go to write my, my notes, I do it in OneNote. I copy that out. I throw it in a byword. That is what people are going to see when my episode is done. I record my episode. I publish my episode. All my text is already done. I usually have my notes done before I ever hit the record button. Not everybody does it that way. What you're going to find is these are my recommendations. As you start through your episode creation process, you're going to find what workflow works best for you. And it may be something different. It probably will be something different. And that's perfectly fine. Um, this is a process that's used by a lot of podcasters, but it evolves and it changes, and everybody does things a little bit differently. Sorry, one more. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Byword, Ulysses, I'm not familiar at all. Are these web-based? Are these downloadable? Do they cost? They um, do have a small charge. Um, Ulysses is more expensive. Byword, I think, was 9 bucks. iOS um, and Mac apps for those two. Okay. So, okay. And, and it's like an application you download. And yeah. Yes. And yeah. They're not web-based. one-time purchase? Yes. Okay. They're not yep. web-based? No. Mm -hmm. Do they? Can you back up to the cloud with them? Easily? Yeah, iCloud, Dropbox, OneDrive. Yeah. I like Google Docs because automatically it's 
backed up. You don't have to worry about yeah. losing anything ever. Yeah. But obviously, I can see if by reviewing the season, it's very good. Elsie so just had one the other day where somebody was copying and pasting from Google Docs, and it was causing them problems with their feed because it's a word processor. And it's got all that extra junk in there. Uh, so some helpful hints for episode prep. Turn off your alarm clocks. <laughs> Set your phones, tablets, and watches to silent. I have broken that rule. I'm in sad for it. Have a drink for yourself. When you start talking into a microphone, you talk with a certain projection. You talk from a certain place in your body, and Elsie's going to love the fact that I just said that, <laughs> being a yoga instructor. You breathe differently. Your mouth can dry out more quickly. Have a drink available. Let the dogs out. If nothing else, then to chase the squirrels away so they're not barking out the sliding glass door like they do for me in the middle of an episode. Review your talking points. Hit record. You want to stay on topic, so your bullet points are going to help you with that. We already talked about writing a script. Keep it natural. And test your hardware and your recording before you walk into that interview, before you actually really want to sit down for an hour and do record. Make sure your setup actually works. Just test it for yourself. Uh, if you're going to use Skype for interviews, Skype has a handy dandy test caller that you can call. And I use that all the time to test my mix minus setup. And I just call her ad nauseum to check my levels, make sure everything's working properly so that when that celebrity does call to do the interview, I know it's going to work. I don't want that failing on somebody important. Finally, hit record. Start talking. Have fun. If you make a mistake while you're recording, don't stop your whole recording. Pause talking. Two, three seconds. Just pause your talking. And then pick up again. As I mentioned before, record in the highest quality you know how via your mic setup, via, via how you speak into your microphone. Record at the highest quality you can so you have less editing to do later. Because by then, you're going to be tired and you don't want to edit. Editing sucks. Maintain a close but comfortable distance from the microphone. Please, people, your microphone is not edible. Do not eat the microphone like this. I tell people to start with the hang ten. This is a comfortable distance, whatever your directional pattern is. This is a comfortable distance to start with. Now, depending on your levels, your gain, all of that fun stuff, you, how you talk, how you project, you may move in or out a little bit, and monitoring is going to help tell you that. But start around here. You don't, you don't want to get in too close to the microphone. So what's going to happen is as you're talking, you're going to get those breaths a lot louder in the microphone than you think. And then you're going to be editing every stinking breath out of your audio. That takes a long time in an hour-long episode, let me tell you. And have fun. Because that's what it's all about. So I did, uh, where is my mouse? <laughs> there it is. I did a quick little video. She said my audio was hooked up. Guess not. This is just showing where I've taken a pause because I made a mistake. And I took another pause here because I made another mistake. So you can see when you're looking at your waveform in your editor, it becomes really easy to tell where that mistake was, so you can jump straight to it and remove it. I think we're coming up on time, so I'm actually going to move through some of this other stuff in 301 after lunch. Um, any questions up to this point? It's a suggestion for, for finding those mm -hmm. uh, mistake moments. I'll either like, snap right in the microphone and do a pop so then it'll create a spike. You can do that. As well, so you can find them. Um, also, apples are good to eat. Yeah. Because it reduces kind of the smacky noises that your mouth can make. Because of the That's a really spike. popular recommendation amongst vocalists. The one thing that you do have to watch is if you eat it right before you go to record, your mouth can overcompensate by creating too much saliva. <laughs> 
and then you end up with more smacking noises. So if you're going to do that, give it like a half an hour before you hit record to let all those glands kind of settle down. If you stay hydrated normally, you don't have to do anything special when you go to record. The problem is, is the majority of us Americans don't like to drink water. So, so we tend to walk around slightly dehydrated and that can add to those, really add to those smacking noises. And the only thing I would say about puffing and causing the spike is if you are using filters in your editor in order to edit out something like noise, it's looking for that noise floor. So what the normal noise level is in the room before anybody makes a noise. It's called your noise floor. As it runs that filter, if you're doing a lot of things that are going to pop that, it's going to have trouble running that filter and determining what is actually noise that it needs to remove and what isn't. So if you're going to run a filter across your whole file, you may run into trouble leveling or running noise filters or noise gates. So that's one of the reasons why I recommend leave a pause because it's so easily visible, but it's not going to affect how those filters are going to operate. Any other questions? No? Everybody hungry? Stand up, stretch, be great. I don't have a detailed write-up. Um, I'm going to create one eventually. I actually meant to set these out, but I ran out of time. So I'll put these out now, and I'll put out my business cards. This is about lips and hosting, which is actually what we're getting to. And you can either catch me at Lipson. Or I'm actually working on a new project that's going to teach this stuff, which will be at thedrunkentech.com. Uh, it's in launch mode at the moment, so I'm still working on it, but you're welcome to have a look. Um, you're certainly welcome to contact me. Otherwise, if you go on to YouTube and do a search for Lipson, there is a channel called Lipson Tutor, and that's me. Those are all tutorials that talk about publishing, Lipson, social media. We also do a Hangout on Air every single month. We should have another one coming up on Wednesday. Elsie, who had to skedaddle for her kids, uh, and I co-host that show, and it's a live Q&A. So we typically try to have a main topic, but hop on in whether you host with Lipson or not, and ask a tech question, and we walk you through it live on air. It's technical. These are technical. Uh, Dave Jackson. Um, so lunch, and then 301, and then after 301, so it would be, what, 2 o'clock. Dave Jackson's going to talk more about content and growing your audience. Uh, he's, he's fantastic with that stuff. So I'd recommend him. Any other questions before we go eat and stretch our legs? In in Lipson well, or in, what, in the WordPress control team. Um, I think somebody is doing a WordPress thing Wait, so you've got right after lunch. We're going to talk about how to publish. And we're going to talk about getting things out to your website. That's in 301 right after lunch. So is, is this going to be video? Yes. yes. They're all yes. being streamed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Break for lunch. <laughs>